Austin Forrest Pivo was a 23-year-old from Fort Hall, Idaho. He was a firefighter and competitive Native American dancer. On the morning of February 3rd, 2018, his mother dropped Austin off at his job. However, he soon discovered work was canceled for that day. Austin then made a phone call and left. He was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. when you saw the title for this episode, you thought of the Tom Cruise film. It was a good one, although given the premise, the movie could have been better. However, my perception is people forget why that film has that title. The reason was because sometimes one of the young people who could see the future would see a different one than the other two. And that opinion was called, well, the title of the film. And it plays a huge role in the plot. Today, Unfound is doing kind of the same thing. Through the interview, we'll be giving you a different opinion on what could have happened in this disappearance, and we are not in the majority, as you will hear, especially when local law enforcement is concerned. However, the title is for another reason as well. We at Unfound are really trying to bring attention to disappearances where the missing person isn't white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant. In fact, it's my fault that I never mentioned during the Cully Sims episode that she was Native American. Well, so is today's missing person, Austin Pivo, who disappeared from the Fort Hall Reservation in Idaho. We at Unfound believe these groups deserve more attention, and we're trying to do what we can, and we hope these families will respond to our messages, and they surely can contact us anytime, African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, whoever, because we want to continue to follow our own minority report. And now, summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend, Making Good's website, charlieproject.org. Austin Pivo was a member of the Shoshone Bannock tribe and raised on the Fort Hall Reservation. However, he went to high school where most of his classmates were white. Austin excelled at sports there and did well with his studies. He was going to go to college, but decided to become a firefighter instead. When Austin had time, he also went out of town to Native American dance competitions where he won money. However, in his early 20s, he got mixed up with the wrong crowd, getting into drugs and having friends with criminal records. Yet, not long before Austin disappeared, he seemed to be on the right track again. So, on February 3rd, 2018, Austin's mother Susan dropped him off at his boss's house, as she usually did. However, his mother would not find out till the next day that work was canceled due to the supervisor being hung over from the night before. What then happened, Susan learned, was that Austin used either the work phone or a co-worker's cell phone to call someone since Austin didn't have his phone with him. He then walked out the door. He was never seen again. Austin's disappearance has a lot less facts than many others we've covered on Unfound. However, the facts that we do know have generated the following questions. Number one. Why did no one in the neighborhood see Austin walking down the street after he left his boss's house? Number two, why is it still unclear whose phone Austin used at his workplace, not to mention who exactly he called? And number three, could a run-in the night before between Austin and a guy he thought was a friend be the cause of this disappearance? Both the local police and tribal officers have been somewhat unhelpful in this disappearance. Their belief is Austin just walked off on his own. Austin's family believes differently. The guest for this episode is Austin's mother, Susan Pivo. Unfound news. We had some technical difficulties during the Think Tank on Patreon this past Sunday night. We got about an hour into it and everything froze up. Not my fault, I don't think. YouTube had a worldwide outage that day, and things weren't totally back to normal when the think tank started. So what we will be doing is continuing the discussion of Dory Myers' case this coming Sunday night, June 9th, on Patreon, along with our study of Austin's disappearance. 
Next, I see that CrimeCon is this weekend in New Orleans. Or is it New Orleans? All of you already know my feelings about it, but for the people who are going, I hope it meets your expectations. And finally, I played in a disc golf tournament this past weekend, and yes, in my humble opinion, I am still a much better reporter and investigator than disc golfer. For sure. 100%. No doubt about it. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Stitcher, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. On Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us on YouTube for the Unfound Live Show. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. This week, I need to thank Delena, Shay, and Faith. You can also contribute to PayPal, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. That is also the email address. Merchandise. The books in Amazon.com in both ebook and print form. Do not forget the reviews. Shirts at myshopify.com, cards at makeplayingcards.com, and please mention Unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the mother of Austin Pivo, Susan Pivo. Susan, welcome to Unfound. Hi. I want to start here with you, and it seems to me this has been in the news a lot about the disappearance of many Native Americans in the United States. And um, and not long ago, we uh, last year we covered the disappearance of some Native Americans in uh, Canada as well. But you are Native American. Why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about your community uh, in Idaho? Um, I come. I live on the Fort Hall Indian Reservation here in Idaho. Mm -hmm. It's between Blackfoot and Pocatello. It's, um, it's a small community. Everybody knows one another. And uh, I would almost want to say the majority of the people who you meet are related to, to you one way or another, whether it be on your mother, father, or grandparent side. Uh -huh. You know, it's really uh, a close community in in certain ways. Uh -huh. um, I'm not, uh, me and my son are not, my family are not enrolled here. We've just, we are, we're enrolled uh, Eastern Shoshone from Fort Washke, Wyoming, okay. on the uh, Wind River Indian Reservation there. Okay. But we we live in we're born here, raised here on this reservation. So I could almost say that this is, you know, like my home reservation, but it's mm. not. Okay. Um, okay. How many people would you say live there? I would say about maybe eight to ten thousand. Wow. Uh, okay. But you know, that those are people that I mean we do there are people that live off the reservation you know i'm um, give or take you know uh, that live in other communities and you know uh, mm -hmm. out of state okay maybe there's more <laughs> okay for sure okay but you say it's a tight-knit community everybody seems to know everybody yes okay all right that's interesting to me because um uh, as I was telling you right before we started this interview, that uh, Emily and I uh, have tried to, within the last few months, tried to reach out to more uh, Native American people, uh, families who have lost loved ones in Native, the Native American community. And we're trying to make that happen here in 2019, once again, because she and I have both read the articles, not just in Idaho, but all over the United States. And um, about um, the issues that Native Americans are having regarding disappearances, and we're trying to put a little bit more of a spotlight on that. Um, would you say in your community that um, you're aware of that? That there there maybe yes. seems to be an issue. Yes, there is. There there is there's an issue, and since my son, uh, probably in the last six months, mm -hmm. uh, I've been trying to. 
get the community to be aware of what's happening, not, you know, outside of the reservation, because right now it's getting close to, it is close here on the reservation here in Fort Hall, where this is becoming, I, want, I, I shouldn't say more prominent, but it's becoming, uh, sorry, but it's becoming more. There's like, mm. there's another young gentleman that's already missing already. Right. You know, and this he, he's been missing for since March, you know. Right. And who's to say that there's, a, there's some younger people, the teenagers that are missing now. And, you know, and I'm trying to make, I'm trying to get people aware that this is happening. Yeah. And it could happen to anybody, anybody's yeah. family. Yeah. Certainly true. Certainly true. Okay. And I do want to talk about uh, that a little bit uh, later in our interview. We will come back to that. But So let's move on to Austin specifically. Uh, you are his mother. Uh, tell the listeners a little bit about Austin. First of all, does he have any other uh, – bro- does he have any brothers and sisters? He has two older brothers. Um, when before Austin was born, his uh, I was going through a lot of things, like a lot of personal problems, and they both got adopted out to family members huh. in my family. Okay. So they he kind of grew up without them, or you know in the immediate family, but he knew his brothers, you know, he knew his mm-hmm. older brother and his, the, the second son, the, my, his second, his, the middle son, <laughs> sorry, uh-huh. the middle son, he grew up in Washington with my, uh, with my sister. So, and oh, okay. we were, they all knew each other. So, but it, okay. It always felt like my Austin was, but my only child, you know, because I raised him. I was, you know, been there, did a lot of things with them. Right. You know. Right. So even though, so even like he, and then maybe it's a little bit my, my, my situation where I was raised an only child, but I had two brothers and a sister. But what you're saying is you essentially raised Austin by himself. Yes. Okay. So you didn't have any children after Austin? No. Okay. All right. What kind of kid was Austin? <laughs> he, when he was little and growing up, he was just just a little happy child, you know. He mm-hmm. was just always fun to be around. He was he grew up, you know, with his cousins, and he was the youngest out of all of them. Out of all his cousins and his brothers, you know, he he was the youngest, and so he was kind of like always, you know, the the one that got picked on <laughs> on that, you know, he was just, but he he was a little fighter, you know. Yeah. He'd always, um, even though he got picked on, he would just bounce right back up and have a big smile on his face and didn't care and be right there with, hanging with them again, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then when he got older, you know, he he grew up tough. You know, I I didn't want him to be, uh, oh, I don't know, some parents let their kids just not, you know, do anything. You know, mm-hmm. be real protective over their their children. But I never, mm-hmm. I never wanted him to be like that. I wanted him to be a tough. You know, mm-hmm. even though he was like an only child. You know, I I let him, I uh, put him in sports when he was young. I didn't want him to be, uh, oh, I'll put it this way, a wimpy child. Yeah, I get <laughs> it. He was, uh, I get it. He played football. He played basketball. He played baseball. He even wrestled. You know, he was wow. he was a good student. You know, even when he was little, uh, I taught him early on in in. Before he went to school, his ABCs, his one, two, threes, he already knew how to tell time before he went, before he got into kindergarten, you know, he was just, I wanted him just to be that much more ahead of everybody before yeah. he went to school. Yeah. You know, and he'd always just, he was just a smart kid. 
Mm-hmm. Sometimes I always thought he was too smart for his own good. <laughs> a little too smart. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's that's funny. Yeah. Uh, now, you did tell me, I believe, that although you live on a reservation, you told me that he went to a high school that was predominantly white people, Caucasian people. Is is that true? Yes. Okay. How did yeah. how did that how did that go for him? He he grew up. It was just normal for him. Okay. You know, he it was just a normal life. You know, he didn't. He really didn't have anything. You know, like uh, I want to say, ill feelings toward anybody. Mm-hmm. You know, he grew up knowing that. That you know, mm-hmm. even though there was oh probably about five or six Native Americans that he went to school with in the whole high school, you know, he, yeah. he didn't really have, you know, ill feelings toward anybody, you know, he wasn't, yeah. you know, not racial or anything like that. No racial problems, anything like that? No. Good. Okay. That's good to hear. What high school, if you can say, what high school uh, was it? Uh, he went to American Falls High School Okay. in uh, American Falls. Okay. Great. Okay, so he was uh, he was into sports, and he sounds like a guy who he, he, you, his mother, told him to not take any crap from anybody. And did do uh, you have any girlfriends in high school? What was the situation there? No, he really didn't have any girlfriends. He had a lot of friends that were girls, mm-hmm. but you know he wasn't really uh, the type of kid to have girlfriends even though girls liked him but i've always just told him you know wait till you get out of high school you know you don't i don't want to have i don't want you to have kids when you're young i don't you know i want you to go out and experience life yeah i want you to you know enjoy life and not have you know worry about children yeah okay sure well i think a lot of parents uh worry about those things of course Okay. Uh, he graduated from high school, and what did he do? Um, at first, he really didn't know what to do. You know, he he wanted to go away to um, high school university in, in Lawrence, Kansas. He put his application in, but he got denied, and I, I never knew or understood why he ever got denied. You know, he... He was a good student, you know, he got A's and B's. He played, uh, he lettered all four years in high school on the football team. Huh. You, know, but I, you know, for some odd reason, he wasn't selected to go to that college. <laughs> but uh, then he wanted to go to uh, enlist into the Marines. But mm-hmm. his grandmother, my mom, she was kind of, she was against it and she like gave that. her opinion okay. yeah and you know that he changed his mind on that and he decided not to go you know based upon what my mom had told him hmm. how did you feel about you that know, if, if i can if i can ask how did you feel about it i kind of thought my mom overstepped her boundaries and hmm. i wanted him to go you know because yeah. i thought it would have been good for him you know to get out there and see the world more yeah. Yeah, and you know, also like that. Like I said, I, yeah, sure. I just wanted him to be independent, you know, and and mm-hmm. along the way, when he was, uh, when he was little, back when he was a little, you know, a baby, I would make a an outfit for him, a regalia outfit, you know, so he could dance at powwows. Mm-hmm. And he was what they know what we call as a grass dancer, and he grew up being a grass dancer all the way till he got to be like thirteen, fourteen years old, and then he started dancing. He wanted to dance a different style. He wanted to be a a round bustle dancer, and which is a traditional uh, dancer. So my dad had um, given him his round bustle that he wore when he was still dancing. Mm-hmm. And that, he was like 13 or 14 years old when he got that bustle from my dad. And, um, so pa- so that was kind of uh, passing it from one generation to the next. 
Yeah. Okay. After skipping a whole generation, it would okay. be like the, okay. you know, two generations down. Okay. And uh, we would travel to different powwows to different states. And, you know, he he was a good dancer. A lot of people uh, gave me props on okay. him and yeah. um, told me that he was, he was a natural dancer. You know, he danced from from his heart and from the inside uh-huh. and, you know, and... Well, no wonder, no wonder he had a lot of women friends because women love guys that can dance. So that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, he we right? certainly did have a lot of women, girl, young ladies chasing after him, but he never okay. never really had to settle down with one, not till after high school and stuff. Okay. Well, let's talk about after high school. So uh, I got denied to this college, didn't end up going to the Marines. Did he end up getting a job? What did he end up do? doing he ended up uh, becoming a firefighter uh for, um wildland fire firefighter blm i'm sorry blm land wildfire i think i said that right for the blm <laughs> okay uh you know it's kind of it's like a tradition you know my dad went i went my sons went my my older son went and then him being the youngest he he went you mm-hmm. know Okay. He went to fight fires, you know, oh. and he loved it. Okay. And is that what he did? Uh, of course, we know that he disappeared when he was 23. Uh, I'm going to guess that he graduated high school when he was 17 or 18. Uh, is that what he did for a majority of that time, or did he have any other jobs? Um, no, he, that's what he did. That was, he, did. did he did it for for the fire season. Wow. And then out there in then after fire season ended, then he would uh, powwow. He would travel. He would, you know, and he would, I'll put it this way. He was a really good dancer. And, okay. and he would come home, you okay. know, sometimes first place, second place. He would come home. Wow, competition. Me. So competitions, yeah. like. Yeah. yeah he dancing competition. competitions. Okay. That's it. Okay. I didn't know about that. Okay. All right. Well, he must have been good if he, uh, and he would make some money doing that. Yeah. Wow. He must and, have been good. Okay. All right. So that's what he was doing. Um, however, there were some things that did happen that, uh, once again, in our prior conversations, that you believe kind of affected him. And we are going to get um, into some things that he was struggling with. But one thing that you told me that really affected him was his grandfather dying. Why don't you tell the listeners about that? He. Um... My dad was a big part of his life. Mm-hmm. And so they were close. And yeah. when did when did he, your father die? Um, August of 2017. Okay. And that no, really really had an effect on him. Yeah, he. He he really looked up to my or my dad, mm-hmm. you know, and his grandfather. His mm-hmm. grandfather had taught him a lot of things, you know. Yeah. From uh, traditional ways, you know, to to doing things, you know. Mm-hmm. He just he just he was always there for. My dad was always there for him, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you, yeah. and it really affected him. Yeah, he, okay. you know, he just felt like he, to me, it seemed like he was lost, you know, after as that, well as, you know, yeah. After that happened. It, I, I think it affected him more, I, can, I shouldn't say more, it just affected him a lot, you know, and he would just take off, just, you know, get upset at every little thing and he would just, you know, take off and mm. He'd be gone for like the whole day and then he'd come back and he'd, you know, and it, it just, it was a never ending thing after that. Mm-hmm. And was this, was this death sudden or was it something that was drawn out? It was a sudden death. Was it? Okay. Uh, there was a fire. Uh, it was, it was a fire that year. And um, my dad, he, you know, he was an older gentleman, you know, in, the, in his 80s and, Mm-hmm. And being the man that my dad is, he didn't want to leave his ranch. 
And oh my. he made my mom leave. He made, you know, my other brother and my granddaughter at that time that was staying there with, with my son. And, and he just my dad and my son, my older son stayed. And, and my dad didn't want to leave. He just. And so there, so there was like a, are you, are you saying this was like a forest fire? Um, yeah, they live, they live, they live out in the country mm-hmm. and the, the, the fire, you know, it, lightning struck somewhere and it just took off. It was really dry that year and it surrounded it. It was really devastating. Okay. It just literally took took everything out and it was amazing that my that their place didn't burn down you know okay. it took everything around their house and yeah okay so your dad got caught up in this fire and couldn't escape is that what happened um it was the smoke it was he the got, smoke was, yeah the smoke and then, okay yeah and then okay all right, and something else that you told me about was that a friend of Austin's actually got murdered. His name is Francisco Martinez. Um, he got murdered. When did this happen? Why did this happen? Uh, why? Why he got murdered? From what I understand, and from what I heard from his grandmother, was that it happened over credit cards. And mm-hmm. it, it, and uh, it was. I don't know whether it was a drug deal. She said, but she no. she believes that drugs were involved. Okay. But it had it had to deal with credit cards, stolen credit cards. I mean, he didn't steal him. No. This other guy thought he stole him, so it ended. Up, he ended up killing killing him over non-stolen credit cards. So, like mistaken identity or something like that. Yeah, and oh, then wow. they tried to. I think what upset him was too was because of the fact that he got killed, and then they tried to burn his body. That oh, that's, that's what was really upsetting to him was that, you know, and we we had just barely me and my me and Austin just barely had seen Cisco like three days before. Mm-hmm. We had given him a ride. We were going to uh, one of my to my niece's uh, daughter's party birthday party. And we were we happened to stop at a, a dollar store, and we seen Cisco, and he goes, "Hey mom, can we give him a ride?" And I said, "Yeah, that's fine." So we gave him a ride, just like three or four blocks down the road, and we had dropped him off at this uh, trailer, uh, trailer, trailer mm-hmm. park. Yeah. And he he got out of the car and he goes, "Hey man, take it easy and take care of yourself." He goes, "You know where I'm at." You can always stop by, you know. Mm-hmm. He just told me, take care of yourself. And that was the last time you seen him. Wow. You know, and that was just like three days before. You know, and I think he really, he took it really hard because, you know, they, they went to school together. Right. You know, he was just a what? little guy and he always watched out for him and took care of him while he was in high school. Didn't let other people pick on him. When yeah. did this happen? When did that happen? Um, I want to say around September, October. It was in the fall time, I remember. Of 2017? Yeah. Okay, so just to put this in the timeline, your father, Austin's grandfather, he dies from this fire and the smoke in August. And then a month or two later, one of Austin's best friends gets murdered yeah wow okay were the the, were the person or persons responsible for this murder caught yeah they were caught they're they're in jail okay yeah okay um let's move all right so that i I can understand so we're talking about six months before the both those uh, situations uh happened about six months before austin disappeared uh, but you also told me that one of the things you think that came of this, that maybe Austin started getting involved in some drugs or something like that. He was so affected by all of this. Yeah, I I knew I knew that he was doing 
some kind of drugs just mm-hmm. by the way he was acting. Um, he was just out of it. It wasn't his normal self, you know. Yeah. I see the change in him. You know, he was more like rage. He was just, you know, it wasn't Angry. physical. Angry. It was angry. It was just the rage inside of him. He would, you could just, you could just see it and hear it, his tone of voice. And then pretty soon he'd be like, like two, three seconds later, or even a minute or whatever, he, the whole thing, demeanor would change. Then he would be all like, da, 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 real happy and whatever. And then, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes he would be up for days and days. And then he, mm-hmm. you know, and then he, or he, gone and then he'd come back and he would just sleep for days you know wake up go back to sleep wake up go back to sleep you know and that wasn't him and you know i knew that okay I just, you, know, you could just see mm. the the physical change in him as well right you know he stopped doing he stopped going to powwows he stopped singing he stopped you know associating with his other friends I see him started associating with different people, uh, people I didn't know, people I've never seen before, mm-hmm. people, you know, that I wouldn't associate with. Right. Did you ask him about this stuff? I mean, could you have a conversation with him about it, or is, did he not want to talk about it? A little bit of both. You know, he, he would, like, brush it off and just say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's just experimental. You don't worry about it, Mom. Mm-hmm. I got this. Okay. You know? Okay. Uh, but you but you never specifically ever saw him uh, take any drugs in the house? No. Okay. I've, you know, I've seen the smoke, smoke marijuana, you mm-hmm. know. But, you know, I really... To me, that that didn't bother me. It was the other kind of drugs that he was right. starting to do. The right. meth, the oxys, the hydros. Mm-hmm. He might have gotten uh, an addiction to essentially what are painkillers that we you know we now know that these opioid addiction that many millions and millions of Americans are suffering with right now. And you think that your son got caught up in that as well? I do believe he did. Okay. All right. But you had told me also, though, that not long before he disappeared, that it seemed to you that he had an epiphany, that he said, you know what, I need to get sober, that he said he wanted to go back to school. Do you remember when uh, that conversation or those conversations happened? It was around the time of his birthday in okay. December, you know, uh, mid-December. You know, he was like, Mom, I need a change. I need, We just need a change of life. You know, I, I need to get out of doing what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I want to go back to school, you know. And that's and it made me feel good. Uh, I bet it did. Knowing that he wanted to change his life. He wanted to get away from what he was doing. And to become, to get on with his life, to start his life, you know, mm-hmm. and that, that, and to me, that was him making a change out of what he was doing and, and wanted to get away from it. Mm-hmm. Right. And in your opinion, between when he told you that in December, and we know that he disappeared in February of 2018, in fact, this is the newest uh, disappearance that Unfound has uh, ever covered. Of course, at this point, it's like about a year and four months old. Um, did you see some changes? Uh, was that just talk? Or did you see some changes in him between then and when he disappeared? Yeah. Um, I started seeing him um, gain more weight. <laughs> he mm-hmm. got, you know, he started gaining weight again. You know, he started looking more healthy and, you know, he wasn't, you know, he got a job, you know, he got, he got a a job working with the 
being a laborer, you know, mm -hmm. and that was good, you know, to me that showed me that he, he was doing, he was doing rather mm -hmm. than not doing things with his life. Okay. You know, like some people just live every day, every day with not doing nothing, but he yeah. started doing something, you know, got a job, you know, and he was, okay. to me, he was showing me that he was being responsible. Good. And you actually knew his boss and we're going to be talking about him later, but that was, he ended up working for somebody who you knew. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So he had some issues there in 2017 that I think that, I think that most people would go, oh, it would negatively affect them losing a grandparent, like the way that it happened. I know all about, I lost my mother within the last six months and I know that, um, you know, people go, we, we all experience this, you know, death is a part of life. So, and grandparents and parents dying, you know, you go to some dark places sometimes when those things happen. So I don't think that's unusual for us. And then on top of that, to have one of his friends murdered, you know, and he saw him just a few days before that, a uh, very tough thing for a young man to go through. But in your opinion, by the time late 2017, 2018 rolled around, it sounds like he had fought through that and was coming out the other side. Is, yeah. Okay. All right. So before we actually get into, you know, the, the, the day, the day before, and we have a lot to talk about there, we just, we do have to go through a couple names that, so the listeners can understand because their name, these, these uh, people are going uh, to come up very shortly. Uh, just in general, we'll talk about him specifically eventually, uh, probably in a few minutes, but just for now, who is Clyde Osborne, and how did Austin know him? Were they friends? Did they go to school together? Was he older? How did the two know each other? <clears throat> Austin met him when he was like, I want to say like 14, 15 years old. Mm -hmm. um, like I told you before, I let Austin become dependent instead of, uh, I'm sorry, independent. Mm -hmm. I started letting him, instead of going to traveling to powwows with his mom or his, you know, uh, with me <laughs> or his grandmother mm -hmm. or his aunties, I started letting him go with his cousin, his cousin Candy, his, uh, his cousin, cousin brother Winston, you know, um, I started letting him go with other people, but people that I knew and I always thought that his cousin Candy was a good influence with to him because she was, you know, she was to me, I see her as a traditional person and she knew a traditional ways. Mm -hmm. And that's how he got to hang around her. And that's how Clyde came in the picture. That's how he got to know Clyde. She's related to Clyde. Austin is related to Candy. And so there's, we just kind of all kind of like knew each other as cousins, aunties, uncles, you know. So he was like almost like a brother to, mm -hmm. to Austin. And, and in, in, a, in age, um, is Clyde, was he the same age as Austin? Was he a few years older? I do believe he was like three or four years older than Austin. Okay. All right, and did you uh, get to know of, of Austin? Got to know uh, Clyde at fourteen, fifteen years old. At the time, did you get to know Clyde fairly well? No, I really didn't know Clyde. I knew of him. Okay. You know, I knew that I knew his mom. I knew what family he came from, but not personally. No, I never really got to know him. Okay. Until Austin started bringing him over. Hey, mom, this is Clyde. Da 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 da. You know, would you say that he and Clyde did a, uh, a and we're going to talk about Clyde's background eventually, and, and it's not a pretty one, but would you say Austin and Clyde hung out a lot? You know, let's say 2015, 2016, uh, they were close. Did they grow apart? How would you explain it? Over the summertime, I, they probably got closer as friends, mm -hmm. but you know, he, they didn't go to school or anything together, so when he um, when he, uh, would go to school, I would make sure that he would go to school and not, you know, take off over there. 
was Candy, it was his cousin Candy's house. But he would travel with her on the weekends if they were going to powwows and stuff like that. Okay. So, and then what he did on the weekend when he was there, I really, I entrusted her with him, you know, but I really mm. didn't know what was going on over there or who was all over there at their residence. So mm. he might have been over there for all I knew, you know. Okay. And we're going to talk about Candy. Candy's going to come up later as well. Now, there's another guy we need to talk about. His name is Ambrose, and you're going to have to uh, pronounce and spell his last name just so we get it right, because I know in our previous conversation, I think I misunderstood uh, his last name. So why don't you uh, give his last name and how to spell it? Okay, his name is Ambrose Watami, W-A-H-T-O-M-Y. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, I got the idea that maybe Austin didn't know him as well, but Clyde and Ambrose did know each other. Um, how did Austin know Ambrose? Ambrose is an older gentleman. I'm thinking he's, he's older than Clyde. I know that. Mm -hmm. they, they know each other through, like, um, ceremonies, uh powwows because Ambrose you, you still does sing you know uh, sing on the, you know in the powwows and stuff like that and okay. but I wouldn't say they were you know know each other like um, close or okay. you know personally you know, okay. just, just knows him in general okay did Clyde, did uh, Clyde and Ambrose both live on the reservation where you and Austin lived? Yes. Okay. In fact, I think they just live right down the road from each other. Clyde lived on one road, and then right down the road, that's where, uh, at a, at a T almost, that's where uh, Clyde, and, or not Clyde, but Ambrose, his family lived. So they, uh -huh. they, they were closely grew up in the same area. Okay, so let's move up now to the day before uh, Austin disappeared, and what went on, I mean, in those few days before he disappeared, anything that you look back at now, before the day, you know, maybe going back to late January, early February, anything that really you know, sticks out to you that you might have been worried. Did Austin tell you anything, anything that you were worried about regarding your son? I, I really don't, I honestly don't. Okay. Never thought of, you know, when I look back on it, there was nothing like showing me red flags, like something that I should be worried about, you know. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like, that he was starting to, you know, like I said, live live his life and and wanted to move on to the next stage of his life, you know. Okay. You know, I knew that he still drank, you know. Well, but, he's twenty three. You know, he's allowed to do that. <laughs> yeah, you know. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, I didn't have, you know. Mm -hmm. It just it didn't. It just seemed like any normal. You know, I didn't like. I said I didn't see no red flags. Anything. Okay, that's that's that that's perfectly fine, Susan. That's what a lot of people say to that question uh, when I ask them, and that's and that's very common. So the night, the day, the night before, there was a ceremony. Uh, maybe you need to explain to the listeners uh, what exactly it was. <clears throat> uh, that night. Um, the previous night before, it was mm -hmm. it was Friday night. Yes, February second. Um, yeah. Um, what they do is they they he was at a ceremony where they we call it the warm dance, and prior to the actual ceremony, they have like uh, singing practices where they practice every Friday night. You know. They 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 sing. The pe people come over, and they, they pray, and they pray for 
to have a good ceremony and that things will go right. You know, my my son's been doing, going to these ceremonies, going to the singing practice way back when he was like 14, 15 years old. You know, even before that, my dad, we would all go, we would all participate, you know, and that's how he grew up. He grew up doing these ceremonies, um, participating, singing, dancing, and that's how my son grew up. Mm-hmm. And... And to me, it was a normal, you know, it was a norm, you know, go ahead, son. You know, he, he he would, before he had a car and he would go over there, he would go over there himself. You know, it was nothing, nothing for me to worry about. You know, I never worried about him going over there and, or, or any harm or anything like that, you know, because the, the people that would go over there were older people, were people in there. 50s and 60s, you know, they were the, the the older generation people that our elders, as what we call them, would go and you know put on the would start the ceremonies, you know. So I had no no worry of him of him getting into a confrontation of what happened that night. Okay, so this ceremony, it's a very common thing. Pretty common. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people a lot of people go. Yeah. It, okay. It's, it's only a one time ceremony in uh how do I put this? In January. January the first Fridays, the uh the first three three or four Fridays in January and then the first weekend in February would be going into the actual ceremony. So there is like a preparation into the into the real ceremony. I guess okay. <laughs> put it like that. Okay. Actual ceremony. And how many people usually attend uh, the ceremony that was on February 2nd? How many people went? Usually about maybe 10 to 15 people. And that okay. you know, and that Majority of these people are family that are people that are there are family members. Okay. You know, one family puts on the ceremony, and other people come, which were you know related to relations. You know. Mm-hmm. Then, but, but something happened there, and we I need the listeners to understand that you didn't find out. You did not go to the ceremony. Austin was there, but. Uh, you didn't find this out till the next morning, actually. Be, I think why you were taking him to work the next morning, but there was an incident there, and this is the reason that I brought up Clyde and Ambrose's name. What did Austin tell you about what happened the night before after the ceremony? Um, I, that that Friday night, I went to go pick up Austin. He called me about quarter to 10, 10 o'clock, somewhere around there. He asked me, he goes, hey, mom, where are you at? Uh, I'm ready. I'm done. Can you come pick me up? And I said, sure. Uh, give me a second. You know, I was at the casino. But, you know, I, like I said, I, I had no worries. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was just knew that he was fine where he was. So I went, went and picked him up. It was, about, it was coming to 10 o'clock. And, you know, he came out, got in the car, and he goes, come on, let's go, let's go, you know, he was like, kind of like anxious to get out of there, you know, and then he goes, hey, let's go over here, you know, we went down to the uh, gas station, you know, he didn't say too much, you know, he just, mm-hmm. real, he was quiet, but he really, he really didn't say too much. Okay. So when we got back, you know, we got some pop, and then we came home, and we were sitting around, I was up till about one o'clock, two o'clock, just watching TV. And I told him, finally, I told him, I'm going to go to bed. And he had, uh, prior to that, he had went, he had left, you know, because he knows some neighbors. He has a neighbor kid up here that he goes and visits sometimes. And then uh, I guess he had talked to uh, somebody, I guess, uh, and um uh, this young girl. Well, anyway, while I was asleep, and this young girl, I could hear this young girl in his room. 
Mm. You know, so <laughs> I guess he had invited her in, even though he let her crawl through the window. <laughs> yeah, she didn't come through the front door. She came in through his bedroom window. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Did you did you know this girl? Uh, no, I I don't know her. Mm -hmm. I only found out later who she was. Um, I really didn't get her first name but, because I guess the, uh, she had bring over some alcohol and they had left their cans in the, in the room. And I had, uh, instead of throwing them away, I just left them in there. Mm -hmm. You know, usually I just, you know, when I go to clean room, I take out all the garbage and stuff, but that time I just left them there and I didn't bother with them. Okay. So she came over, uh, was this, do you believe this is a common occurrence? With his girlfriends, or I mean, with young women. Would you say that it's uh, co was common for a girl to come out? I'm not here to get too deep into his personal life, unless it has something to do with his disappearance. But would you say that it was common for girls to come over and come in through the window to visit him? Yes, if he didn't want me to know who they were. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So that's a yes. Okay. That's fine. And okay. Um, I'm just trying to establish if this was something odd or not. So she came in, do you believe that she stayed the night or did she leave like a couple hours later? What do you think? I think she left a few hours later because, you know, when I woke up, he, I didn't see no car outside. I, you know, I didn't okay. hear nothing. Okay. So he goes to the ceremony and we still haven't talked about the incident that happened after that because he didn't tell you about it until the next morning, but he gets home. He goes up to see if somebody down the street he comes back. This girl comes over. She leaves. And then the next morning, though, he has to go to work. And you uh, drive him to work. And what does he tell you while you're driving him to work? He wakes me, you know, he, he wakes me up about 7 you know, seven, seven thirty, and he's like, "Come on, mom, I need to get to work. I need to get to work." And I'm like, "You know, freaking early in the morning, you know." And he's like, "All right." So he, get, you know, I take him to where his boss lives. Before he, you know, he he goes, "Mom, can I just borrow your phone? I want to get on Messenger." You know, I don't know who he's messaging. You know, that's his business, not mine. And he doesn't. He don't really talk to me. All, all on the way over, you know, which is sometimes the normal because I don't, you know, if he wants to talk to me, I'll, you know, mm -hmm. he'll talk to me if I don't want to, you know. It's, anyway, we get going down the road, and right before we get to his boss's place, we get turned into his driveway, and then he looks at me and he goes, Hey, mom, I'm just going to let you know that, hey, um, Clyde pulled a knife out on me last night. And I looked at him and I was like, what? You serious? Hmm. I go, you know, what's wrong with you guys? I was like, I was upset at both of them. Not hmm. Clyde, but, you know, hmm. I'm like, hmm. why Why did he do that? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, you know, I was trying to get it out of him, but he wouldn't say anything. He was like, mm -hmm. I just look at him like, you know, why, why does this happen? You know, yeah. you guys are like brothers. And he goes, he, you know, he wouldn't give me, he wouldn't say anything to me about why Clyde had pulled a knife out on him. Mm -hmm. Did he also say you know, that, Amb did he also say that Ambrose was with Clyde? No, I, I he didn't tell me that Ambrose. Okay. He did to Clyde specifically. Okay, just he but just later on. okay. So at the time when you were driving him to work, and this is the day that he disappeared, when he did tell you this, he just said Clyde. He didn't say any other names. Yeah. Okay. But and was, you know, and just to be clear, so, before he got out of the car that day, he never did give you an explanation. Um, we'll get into what that might have been a little later, but at that time, he never gave you an explanation on why that happened. No. Okay. He didn't. Okay. Okay. Um. So, I mean, that just must have, uh, like you said, you were angry, uh, kind of maybe a little upset with Austin. Hey, you're supposed to be friends. What the heck's going on? 
Was that kind of your attitude? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of like, like why, you know, because I asked him, I said, why, why are you guys fighting anyway? Mm-hmm. You know, why, you know, why? You know, because mm-hmm. to me, they were like brothers, you know, like. Right. You know, if one gets in trouble, they both get in trouble, whether it be for me or whether it be from somebody else, you know, family wise, you know, they're just exactly like brothers, you know, mm-hmm. one does something wrong, they're both getting in trouble, you know, and that's just, mm-hmm. that's how I treated them both, you know. Would you say that when Austin brought that up, that he seemed worried about it? Did he seem fearful? Did it seem like he thought it might happen again? What do you think? He seemed angry. Seemed angry. Okay. He he seemed angry to me because that like 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 how could my brother do that to me? Mm-hmm. You know, my friend. How you know? I don't know. And what was strange to me was why did Clyde go to the ceremony? Clyde's never gone to any kind of ceremony hmm. of such sort. He's not that kind of a person. He's not the kind of person to go to a powwow and sit there for the whole thing. He doesn't go to ceremonies. He don't go. He has never gone to the warm dance ceremony. He's never gone to a sun dance ceremony. He's never participated in either one of them two, or or a powwow. Hmm. You know, and that was kind of strange to me. You know, later on when I started thinking about things. Right. Like, why did he even go? He do you think that? Do you think that um, the reason he, the only reason he was there, was to confront Austin because he knew Austin would be there? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you're driving him. You have this conversation, but then you finally get to where. So you have this conversation. You're worried. And I'm sure you're gonna you you're thinking you're gonna talk to Austin about this later today when he gets home from work and maybe even try to see, you know, figure out what Clyde was thinking, et cetera. But Austin gets out of the car at the guy he was working for, and what is this guy's name? His name is Blandon Kobe. Okay. How do you spell that last name if you could? Kobe. C-O-B-Y. C-O-B-Y. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Austin gets out, and you actually see him go up to Blandon's house. You saw him go inside. Yeah. You know, I wait. Me, I don't know, my mom, when, my mom's always told me, whenever you drop a person off, make sure that they get in the house, Mm -hmm. you know, because you don't want them standing outside what if nobody's home? You know, you got yeah. you got to make sure that they that they get inside the house and that they're they're okay. You know, and mm-hmm. then then you can go ahead and leave. So I waited for him to go inside the house. You know, and so it was like any other day that you've ever dropped Austin off there. Yeah. Okay. Just just a normal day. Okay. Um, and so later that day. When did you start thinking that something might not be right? Because that is the last time that you uh, saw us. And we'll talk about a little bit what might have transpired after you dropped them off. But later that day, when did it start? you start thinking, hmm, something's not right? It probably wasn't until the next day, hmm. the next, next afternoon. Because he's, you know, he used to, he he would stay with that guy. He would stay with his uh, employer. You know, his employer had a place where his workers can stay. You know, all right, uh, like a secret room, like a board, like a. It, it was like a, uh, I want to say a boarding house, but not quite a boarding house. But he his workers would stay over. You know, stay the night or two nights. Whatever, if he needed them directly to go to work in the next morning, you know, they they'd be able to stay there, you know. And Austin even had uh, a bag of clothes in case he, you know, would spend the night and then he would go to work the next day, you know. Okay. I knew that, but it was nothing out of the normal for me 
to not think that, you know. Okay. But when, but later on the next day, toward the afternoon, late afternoon, evening time, I was like, well, where's he at? How come he's not calling? How come he didn't, you know, message me? Hey, mom, you know, I'm over here. Or me, mom, I'm, you know, at work, mm-hmm. you know, or hey, can you come pick me up later? You know. Mm-hmm. So I started texting his brother. First person I texted was his brother, uh, my older son. Mm-hmm. I asked him, I said, hey, have you seen your brother around? And he said, no. So I started texting my other family, my sisters, his cousins. Did you try calling yeah. uh, Austin? Had a, Austin had a phone with him, a cell phone? No, he had Messenger, and oh. I would, you know, okay. he, he had he he had a phone, but it didn't work, or he it didn't have minutes on there. Uh, okay, you know, it was a printed phone. So I would message his messenger, you know, hoping that he would mm-hmm. see it somewhere. Use somebody else's phone to connect to his own messenger. Okay. All right, so you tried calling uh, or texting one of your sons. He hadn't seen him. You tried some other people. Did anybody in in the process when you were doing this, did they ever call you and say, hey, I've been trying to track Austin down and he's not responding, anything like that? No. No? Okay. They just, you know, everybody that I talk to, they just say, no, I haven't seen him. Or I seen him like two days ago or three days ago or, you know. Okay. Did you end up at some point calling his employer, this Blandon guy, who, of course, you already knew? What did you did you try calling him or texting him? And did he have anything to say about Austin? I I tried calling him, um, but I got no answer. So I just said, I would leave a brief message like, "Hey, this is Austin's mom. Can you call me?" Mm -hmm. I still get no answer back from him. So I text him and I said, hey, this is Austin's mom. Can you, you know where he's at? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen or heard from him in a few days. He goes, yeah, he was here, but he left. And and I go, what day was that? And he goes, then he, that was that Saturday. And I was like, I go, and you haven't seen or heard from him since then? This was like the fourth, the fourth of uh, Mm -hmm. uh, February 4th and the fifth. No, the fourth I called him, the fifth is when I finally got a hold of him. Okay, so that would have been a and Monday. Yeah. Okay. And is so, are we to understand, and, and we had talked about this, when you finally did talk to his employer, did he give you the impression that that day that you drove off to Austin to work, that there was no work that day? What happened? Mm, he didn't tell me direct. He, he didn't tell you that. Hold of him. He didn't. No, I didn't know that he didn't have work that day. Mm-hmm. No. Okay. And so the employer, the guy you talked to on Monday, who is Austin's boss, he never told you that. He told me then that 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 Monday mm-hmm. when I finally got a hold of him that there was no work, and that huh. he just used a phone and uh, made a phone call and then he left. Okay. Why wasn't why wasn't there any work on that Saturday? So Friday night was the Saturn uh, ceremony. Saturday is when you drove uh, Austin to work. You tried calling his employer on Sunday when you got worried in the afternoon, but you didn't talk to him to that Monday. Um, did the employer explain to you why there was no work on that Saturday? No, he didn't explain to me. Mm-hmm. I didn't find out till later on after. Okay. I had talked to the detectives. Okay. All right. We will talk. Okay. So I just wanted to make that clear. So, so you talked to the employer on Monday. He told you that uh, Austin, yes, of course, did go to work on Saturday. You saw Austin go inside. But after the employer told you that story, when was it that you finally decided, you know what? I think I'm going to have to call this into police. I just have a bad feeling about this. It was like about. Um, three months, two three and a half months. months, three months later. Okay. And if you could, and I know that seems, I'm going to say, you know, it, that may seem like a longer 
time than maybe other people might wait. But as I was telling you on, off the air, that we've I've had some cases where people didn't file police reports for eight or nine months. Why did it take in this particular case for you uh, to wait two and a half, three months? I had, um, you know, I called. I, you know, I I talked to my family, you know, to see if anybody knew or seen him, where he was. You know, I called the police, the jails. I mean, I called mm-hmm. the jails. I called the hospitals. You know, the homeless shelters. I, I, you know, I kept messaging him. I put it on Facebook. Hey, son, where are you at? You know, call me. Let your mom know where you're at. You know. Mhm. I just, you know, my my older son would go look around at the bars and stuff like that. You know, and we would just always be on the lookout. But what kind of deteriorated me from going to? to do a police report was I had talked to a tribal officer mm-hmm. and I knew this tribal officer and this tribal officer. I asked him, I said, Hey, what do you, what do you guys do? And when a person is missing and he told me, well, there's not really much we can do. You know, all we can do is give me his name or give me their name at the place where they live and we'll just do a, a welfare check. And I was like, are you serious? You know, in my mind, I was thinking, are you serious? This is all you guys can do is just do a welfare check. Mm -hmm. And I go, what if this person's living with you? You know, and you know that this person is not around or, you you know, they're not here physically. Mm -hmm. And they go, well, you know, just give me the name, address, and we'll go see. And I'm like, I was kind of pissed, you know. I was mad. Of course. And this is... This is a tribal officer telling me these things, and I'm like, you guys are just, sorry, but you guys are just full of shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, if you're going to tell me this and this is all that you could do for me, you know, mm-hmm. why why go to you guys then? Why go to to some kind of law enforcement, you know, to report in missing? Mm-hmm. And so you explained to this guy, hey, my son, I dropped him off at work. His boss said he made a phone call, and then he just walked off. And this tribal police officer couldn't seem less interested. Exactly. Okay. All right, so that's one of the reasons it's caused you just got such a bad, had such a bad experience with this guy that it said, why even bother to file a police report if this is all, if this is how they're going to handle it. They're just going to blow it yeah, off. Okay. I didn't care. No, okay. no feelings. No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We hear about that a lot on Unfound. So that is, uh, unfortunately, that guy's uh, reaction is not unusual. Not not in the world that, that I live in with Unfound. Um, so over those, um, the next month, you talk to his friends. Uh, nobody says that they they saw him. Nothing like that. Yeah, I've had. Okay. I've had like you know his friends would come over, mm-hmm. and uh, they would you know or I'd see them in the where I work in a in a public place, and when I would see them, I would just ask them, "Hey, have you guys seen him? Have you seen my son?" They would say, "No, I haven't seen him since end of uh, December or the beginning of December or mm-hmm. last you know that that's the last time they seen him." You know, they or they would come and ask me, "Hey, where's your son at? Where's Austin at?" And then I, you know, I, you know, I tell them I don't know. Then they, a few of them would say, "Okay, well, I'm gonna go look for him. When I find him, I'll let you know. I'll tell him to call you, or you know, vice versa. I would tell mm-hmm. him to tell him to call me." So, Austin goes to work, disappears. You talk to his employer. You find out that there, and we're going to talk about that once again here in a moment, that uh, there wasn't any work for that day, allegedly, and Austin made a phone call. We're going to talk about the phone call, and he took off. You tried to file a police report, but the, you got such a bad, had such a bad experience with a tribal officer that you said the heck with that, 
And so you tried to call around and do your own little bit of investigation, but nobody, uh, to your knowledge, or who were, would admit it, saw Austin at all. Yeah, correct. Okay, all right. So we're to believe that the way it's all explained is that Austin goes to, to his boss's house, makes a phone call, walks off, nobody sees him again. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right, now we're going to move on to some other things now. Uh, and it, it, I do, do have to ask you something because we're going to talk about them in a second. Being that uh, this happened and you know the story that Austin told you right before he get out of the, got out of the car, uh, was it in your mind that possibly Clyde could have had something to do? Just did that enter? I'm not saying they did it. We are not saying that. But that did that enter your mind when you started figuring out that Austin was missing for a few days. Did that cross your mind? Yes. Okay. All right. No. Okay. Once again, we're not saying that Clyde did anything. We're not doing that. But I'm just wondering, being that Austin told you that right before he got out of the car, I'm going to guess that that was a statement that uh, probably to this day rings very loud in your mind. Yes, it does. Okay. It Okay. It had a sound effect on me. Let's put it that way. Okay. So, given that, and this is where we're going to talk into get into these details a little. Uh, you know, we've gone over the generalities now. We're going to get in deep into the details. Clyde actually came over to your house a not a few days after uh, the last day that Austin was seen. Why don't you tell the listeners about what went on? He, you didn't have to track him down. He actually came to your house. Please explain that. It was, uh, it was about, I want to say about ten thirty, between ten thirty and eleven. And you know, I usually don't open the door for nobody, but I, I, at that late, at that late hour, I don't open up the door for nobody. Okay. I'd seen who it was, so when I opened the door, you know, I put my put my foot behind the door so that he wouldn't, you know, come mm -hmm. in through the whole door. But okay. he didn't. He acted like he didn't want to come through the door. Clyde, Clyde was at standing at the doorway uh, at my door, and uh, so I opened the door for him, and I put my foot behind the door so that you know he wouldn't totally come in through the door. Mm, sure. You were, but, but, given that Austin told you that just a few days before that, you were a little worried. Yeah. Okay. So when he, you know, I was expecting, hey, where's Austin at? Hey, have you seen Austin? Mm -hmm. Do you know where Austin's at? You know, these are always questions that he asked me every time he sees me way before before you know these were questions he would ask me hey well, how was my brother hey where's my brother at do you got a phone number how can i reach him where's he at you know or you know he's always wanted to know where he was but this night i don't know the individual that he was with that was in his vehicle i, I could only see what he looked like but his expression when he came up to the door, his facial expression, his demeanor was, hey, how are you doing? Are you okay? Hmm. And I just looked at him like, and I didn't ask him, why are you asking me these questions? I didn't ask that. I was, you know, I was, I'm, was by myself in my apartment. Yeah. You know, and I didn't want to. make him angry or have a confrontation with him. Mm -hmm. I just, I just looked at him and I just asked him, I says, what do you want? And then he said, Oh, I just come over to borrow a computer cord. And I, he goes, do you have a computer cord that I could borrow? And I looked at him and I said, no, I don't have one. And I asked him, is that all you want? And he was like, yeah. I said, okay, well, bye. And I closed the door and locked it. And I made sure that he left. 
So he, so Austin's name never came up in that conversation. No, he never said. You know, mm-hmm. I heard that Austin's missing. Just wondering what's going on and wondering how you're handling. Austin's name never came up. Never, never once in that. Okay. What you know to me, what felt like fifteen, twenty minutes was mm. probably only like three or four minutes. Okay. Maybe even well, if that was what the conversation was, I guess it was been less than that. Um, did you? I of course. You, what you're saying is you never did ask Clyde about the knife incident that Austin told you about. No. Okay. I. I don't want to make him mad. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, okay. I don't know whether it's me trying to make him mad. I don't want to make him mad. Of course not. I I would probably, I, you know, I run these scenarios through my head. Mm-hmm. You know, what if we were when and if ever I ever see him, you know, but it's always in the public. You know, and I don't want to make a public scene. I don't want to get into an argument. I don't want to be confronted. You know, what what if I do something to him that's going to cause me to go to jail? You know, right. I, you know, I would, I probably would, you know. Okay. But now that, you know, that was then, you know, that was back then. But now I don't, I, I just look at him. And he looks at me like, you know, he's waiting for me to ask questions. I, I you know, I, I could see it and you know, he's afraid to talk to me. Well, how many times uh, since that has, since that night, so three or four days after Austin disappeared, has Clyde ever come over to your house since? Never. That was the last time I've ever. Okay. And have you had any conversations with him? since that night even if it was just three or four words just once okay he 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 came up to me while i was at my place of work and he's come up to me and he says hey i've heard some things about austin that i think you should know mm-hmm. and i told him i said you know don't talk to me. You take it to the police. You take it to the detective and you tell him. Okay. And that was the only time that I've ever talked to him. Okay. All right. We will talk again about Clyde once again a little later, but I just wanted to, we just want to try to keep this in the timeline that he never explained why he came over to your house. We can take for granted that it was because he heard about Austin's disappearance, but he never explicitly said that. Correct. Okay. Let's move on to this. And this goes back to the phone call that Austin made. When did you end up talking to one of Austin's coworkers? I, um, I didn't directly talk to him. Mm -hmm. What I was told was through the detective. Okay. The detective, because I would, uh, after that was after I had filed a report. Okay. And I let him know. And then after he supposedly done his investigations, whatnot, mm. then he came and told me, or I, I had okay. to call him to ask for information. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll remember that. So what did this co- coworker, he was there allegedly that morning when Austin was there. And what did this coworker say? Um, like I said, it come direct, come from the detective. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was told that, I was told that, that Austin went in and he was asking if there was any work. The coworker told the detective that there was no work that day because the boss was still passed out from the night before because they had been drinking. Okay. So Austin had used the telephone, or not telephone, but had used one, had used somebody's cell phone. I don't know whose cell phone, whether it be the boss's or whether it be his, but used a phone to make a phone call, and then he left. He left. And this is what that coworker said? Yes. Okay. 
And we have to remember that Blandon, who you talked to a couple days after Austin disappeared, did Blandon ever admit that he was too drunk, that there was no work that day? Did he ever tell you that when you talked to him? No. Okay. But on the other hand, it seems that the boss's statement about how Austin made a phone call and how the coworker said that Austin made a phone call, those stories seem to go with each other. That, that maybe is the truth. Correct. Yeah. Okay. But you still to this day, though, don't know whose phone Austin used. No. Okay. Okay. How many, do you have any idea, has the detective or anybody else given you an idea how many people were even there that morning when Austin showed up? So we know the boss was there. It sounds like he was passed out, though. We have this co-worker. Any other co-workers there, to your knowledge? Just as far as I know, there was just those two and Austin there. Okay. That so, morning. all right. So Austin had to have used either the boss's phone or the co-worker's phone, but neither of them have ever told you who Austin called, even though Austin used one of their phones. Correct. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, but uh, since then, have you ever, uh, has the co-worker continued to be helpful like that, or has he kind of... Um, avoiding talking about it now how would you portray that to me it seems like he just faded himself out of the picture Did you he? Know, like he don't you know want to you know be questioned or he don't want you know don't want nothing to do with it that's okay. just my opinion my okay. feelings my thoughts okay and uh you know who this co-worker is we're not going to use his name but do you know who he is I've seen him a few times before. Mm -hmm. I, you know, he's he's come over to my apartment. I, you know, he's even slept outside of my apartment in his car because he was homeless. You know, and I and I've told my son, huh. I says, if he's going to sleep out there, then at least let me know that that's him out there, so I won't be calling the cops thinking that there's some homeless man outside sleeping in the car in my parking area. You know. Yeah. And my son goes, okay, I'll let, I'll, I'll make sure to tell you, mom. You know, and that's how he would catch a ride to work sometimes with, was with this guy, you know, and okay. I, I never really met him directly. I've just, you know, seen his face, you know, and he seemed like a, a nice guy, you know, but he, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, he was homeless, you know, okay. he did in, in Austin working there, did this guy's name ever come up with you when you talked to Austin about his work? Did Austin ever say anything about this coworker guy? Um, just in jokingly manners about how funny he was and, you know, like like how okay. some of the stupid things that this guy would do, you know. Okay. Nothing nothing red flags or nothing out of the ordinary, you know, like, oh, yeah, he did this or he did that. No, it was more of a, a friendly, jokingly manner, the stupid things that he would do, you mm -hmm. know, or he could have done it this way or he could have done it that way, but instead he did it this way, you know. Okay. Kinda so like it didn't sound guy. like he <laughs> does, didn't sound like Austin had any beefs with this guy. No. Okay. Now, 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 this is something that I was thinking about, you know, being that Austin didn't have his own phone and he had to use some other phone and he called somebody, which to me means that whatever number he called, it was either in the phone that he used or he knew somebody's number off the top of his head. Um, how many numbers do you think that Austin knew off the top of his head of people to call and who would those people have been? I could only three for sure. Three numbers for sure. Okay. And one is a possibility. Okay. Give but, your opinion. Whose numbers would he have known off the top of his head? Uh, my, my personal cell phone number, my work number, his grandmother's number, and his cousin Candy's number. 
All right, and Candy is somebody that we mentioned early on who had some connections to Clyde. Okay. All right, so all right, so I want the listeners to remember that because that's going to pop up later. I think that's, I think this is actually a very important part of this case. Uh, I got to tell you, and this is this came up. Uh, this situation uh, came up in another disappearance I covered recently, where it was also the trying to figure out um, the numbers that a person would know off the top of their head because we today in the 21st century with our cell phones, we don't know anybody's phone number. We just hit the button on our phone. I like know my yeah. dad's phone number, but don't ask me to name anybody else's phone number because I don't know it. So um, I'm I'm going to guess that Austin was very much the same way. So it's interesting that he would just take somebody's phone and dial a number. It means that that number must have been very important to him. All right, so I just want the listeners to point that out. So you eventually, three months later, you did file this police report. It sounds like you had some interactions with the detective. He told you what this coworker said. However, um, we do have to remember that uh, the FBI does sometimes get involved in these cases, and there was so, was there some sort of uh, discrepancy about the FBI being involved or not? Yes. Yes and no. I, I, you know, I want to say yes and no. Okay, please explain. Um, the um, the time had went on, you know, in in the investigation, and you know, in my family, and my nephew in particular, he wanted to know what was going on. He wanted to know, like, details. He, he wanted to know what the detectives knew. So he took it upon himself to call to to the, the, we call it the Justice Center. It's called the Justice Center here in Fort Hall. He called the Justice Center, talked to the head detective. The head detective told him, yes, the FBI is involved. And they're doing what they can do. And he, he went back and he told his mom. His mom called, told me that yes, the FBI is involved, you know, and and I'm thinking that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing that they're involved because they're going to get somewhere. Some they're going to do something about it. Something's going to happen. Somebody's going to be brought in. Somebody's going to be questioned. You know, these were things that were going through my head. That you know, I'm thinking, good, we're going to find him. We're going to, we're, questions are going to be answered. People are going to be brought in. You know, all of these things were going through my head until it probably had to be about maybe two months later. I come to find out when I was talking to the detective, the FBI was never involved. Mm -hmm. And that they did and he told me, the detective told me that the FBI won't be involved until a year later after his anniversary date of him being missing for a year, mm -hmm. of my son Austin being missing for a year. Mm -hmm. So I waited a year and a few days after, February 3rd, 2019, I went called the detectives and I asked them, okay, well, it's been a year now. Is the FBI going to be involved? And he told me that the FBI told him that they don't involve themselves in missing people. Well, that's just not true. That's just not true. I mean, we've, uh, got, I know that I've covered, uh, I realize that maybe FBI is reluctant to get involved in some, many disappearances. They do obviously get involved in disappearance involving children, uh, especially if they think that they've taken, uh, um, been taken over state lines. But uh, when it does involve, uh, you know, I know that my perception is that the FBI has much more involvement in law enforcement if it does involve Native Americans than it does other people. That's my perception. Um, 
I mean, any comment on that? Is that why you thought that maybe the FBI would get involved? Yes. Mm -hmm. That, you know, mm -hmm. I thought that they were, you know, mm -hmm. because I dropped him off on the reservation and to where my son is, uh, an enrolled member of the federally recognized tribe. You know, I thought they would at least look yeah. into it. Yes. Talk to people. Yes. You know, bring people into question. You know, and, and you know, he was threatened with the knife. Right. You know. Right. Nothing. Ever, you know, in my mind, nothing ever became of it. They just like swept it underneath the rug and started on with another what they call a lead, I guess. Mm hmm And then you follow through with it. Have you ever I, tried to contact the FBI uh, yourself? Not personally, no. Okay. Well, I'm just going to say this right on the air. That that's probably should be put on your to-do list. Okay? It's just an opinion. Okay, if this is uh, because they're not involved, the year has passed and the FBI is not involved, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there was a discrepancy there, and I can, I certainly can understand why you would have been excited that they got involved. And I can also then just, I'm sure the listeners can understand why you're very dejected when you found out that that wasn't the case. Totally understandable. But I should tell you that in the disappearance that I've covered, 130 of them, the FBI is not involved very often. Okay. In fact, I can maybe think of mm -hmm. two or three cases off the top of my head out of 130 where they've actually been involved. So on one hand, I maybe it's kind of right, but on the other, given your um, Native American ethnicity, heritage, uh, the way you know we handle those things in the United States, it does seem the FBI would be more likely to get involved. So, okay. Uh, have the police done, ever asked anybody to do any lie detector tests? The boss, the coworker, Clyde, anybody else? Um, have they looked into anybody's phone records? Anything regarding any of that? As far as I know about people taking lie detector tests, the only two that were taken was his boss, Blandon Kobe, and the co-worker. Okay. And, um, how, and how'd they do? Um, apparently, they passed. <laughs> yeah, hmm. That's what he said. Okay. Um, he, couldn't, he couldn't do can. They scheduled... They scheduled interviews and lie detector tests for candy mm -hmm. and they did and and same way with clyde but they couldn't the detective told me that the the, the lie detector tests have to be scheduled because they come out of pocatello which is the next city the next city over that they have to come in on to the reservation to do the lie detector test they just can't simply just come over and do it. They have to be a scheduled time. Mm -hmm. So every time they schedule a lie detector test for Candy to come take one, she doesn't show. She she will say that she will show up. She doesn't show up. They go to her house. She doesn't open the door. She doesn't you know return any of their phone calls. She just doesn't want to do it. Doesn't want to come in and do a statement either. You know, you know. Okay. And we also have to remember, being that we just talked about this a few minutes ago, is that your cousin Candy, and we're going to get talk a little bit about her in a second, a little deeper, but she is a person who you believe that Austin would have known her phone number off the top of her head, his head. Correct. Okay. So there's the possibility that if the Blandon and the, the, the co-worker and the boss are telling the truth, if that is true, then it's a good possibility that Austin might have called her that morning. Yes. Okay. All right. And then maybe that's the reason she doesn't want to um, take a lie detector test. It's a possibility. I'm not here to necessarily theorize, but I think I just need to put some things together 
uh, for the listeners to maybe understand this. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Candy. Of course, she's been mentioned a few times now. Uh, how is, exactly is she your cousin? Um, she she would be Austin's cousin. Austin's she, cousin. Her, okay. her, yeah. Her mom is my cousin, and we're related on their dad's side. Wow. So her dad. Her dad, we're, we're like blood cousins. We're close related. Okay. So my dad and her, her grandpa are, are brothers. Oh, okay. That's, you know, that's kind of closely okay. related. Okay. So that's why I never really had any reason for my son not to go over there. Of course. You know, not, you know not to hang around her, not to be with the family because, you know, that's family. Mm -hmm. And you said earlier in this conversation that Candy was one of the people that Austin used to go with when he would do these comp dance competitions outside of the area. Yes. Okay. And Candy is the one, the and Candy is the one who knew Clyde. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, how far does Candy live from where Austin went to work that morning? I would say about a good block and a half. That's it. Yeah. That's it. No. Wait. What do you? Uh, I don't. I, I'm sorry. Maybe. I'm thinking a block is like a you know a big square block, but I'm it's probably more than that because the, where they li where they work and where she lives is like a field, so mm. that may be more maybe about two, so two or three blocks. All right, so like would you a say a mile, block. a mile, a half mile? Yeah, about a mile. Okay, so not Walking far. Distance. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so we have to can we have to maybe consider that that he could have walked there. Now, something else though is that could have Candy been a witness to Clyde pulling this knife on Austin that night before? Could she have been there? Do you think? She was the one that told me that Clyde had pulled a knife out uh, a few days later. After the incident and mm. after Austin had gone missing, she okay. was the one that told me that Clyde, and this is where Ambrose comes in the picture. Okay, Clyde please. Clyde and Ambrose were outside. We're outside. Clyde was the one that pulled a knife out on Austin, had a knife out on Austin, and they were, uh, he was getting mad at him. Uh -huh. And when she went outside, she seen them and she told Clyde, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? You shouldn't be doing that. Uh huh. So she seen, she actually seen it. Okay. That, that Clyde had, had done that to my son. Okay. So Austin told you first the next morning. And then a few days later, when you're still trying to figure out where Austin is, and of course, we're trying to figure out this day, but this is after you talked to his boss in those early days that you talked to Candy, and she also talked about Clyde pulling the knife. Yes. Okay. And then that's how I found out that Ambrose was there. Okay. And did Candy ever explain to you why Clyde did that? No. She never did, never offered or or said anything why he did what he did. Uh-huh. Did he ever explain, did she ever explain how Austin got away from Clyde? Because it doesn't seem like Austin told you that. Did Was this just something that he walked away and Clyde didn't want to follow him? How did, did Candy ever explain that? No, she never explained. You know, she just. She just kind of like just it sounded to me like she just kind of wedged herself in between them and just made him leave. Okay. Made Clyde leave and told Austin to go back inside. That's the impression that I got because this oh. all happened outside of uh -huh. her residence. 
while everybody was inside, just them three were outside, and then she came outside. Okay. And seeing what was going on, the confrontation. Okay. What is your, before this ever happened, before Austin disappeared and everything, what was your general opinion on Candy? Were you close? What Was she um, shady? Anything like that? How would you explain her to the listeners? Way back a long time ago, I always thought that she was a good person because she... You know, she come from a good family. Her upbringings were traditional. She had a, a, a traditional upbringing. You know, I was I seen her as a good person, but later on, as my son got older, I you know I could see that she was she wasn't a very good person. Okay. And I tried to explain to my son, maybe you need to start staying away from her. Maybe you shouldn't be going over there. Maybe because, you know, I seen him start doing, you know, smoking marijuana. He started drinking. He started going over there more often than he should be, you know. And then Mm -hmm. uh, right before he had gone missing, I, I found out that she was doing other drugs. Okay. I found out that she was, she was dealing she was uh, smoking uh, or doing meth, and okay. um, she was doing uh, smoking marijuana. I mean, not okay. doing, but smoking. Okay. You know, and, and then, all right. And but so here's uh, please was not very good after that. Say that again, please. Oh, my my impression of her after that, after I had found out that she was doing all these things, mm. were not very good. I didn't think highly of her anymore. Okay. You know, and... Well, here's uh, the, the point that sticks out to me. Uh, you did ask her to try to help find, go out and search for Austin. And what did she say? She asked me for gas money. She asked me, oh, well, do you have $10? <clears throat> so the, you have ten dollars I can put in gas so I can go look for him. She goes, I think he might be over here at so and so house or her other friend lives here in town site. I know where he stays. Maybe he might be over there. So, you know, she kept asking me for gas money. So I you know of course I would give her gas money to go look for my son because, you know, mm-hmm. at me I thought anything would help. Of you know, course. But I didn't realize that, you know, so maybe she was just using me for money when maybe she knew all along where he was or what happened. I, you know, that's. Okay. That's, well, just, just so you know, Susan, I mean, I've covered 130 disappearance cases, and this is the first one where I think anybody, you know, person has been asked to help, and they say, well, are you going to give me gas money? That is the first time I'm pretty sure in 130 cases. It's pretty unusual. Okay, um, so mm-hmm. I I think that you maybe and I think that you know that it's unusual. Um, it's not like you were asking her to fly across the United States and expect her to pay for it to do a search. You're just asking her to go out into the neighborhood, like in a square mile or something, and just try to help out. And she wants money for that. Yeah. Okay. She did. Okay. We got it. Okay, you did give her the money. Yes, I did. I oh. gave her money to go. Okay. Was she I, helpful? I she was went she... to go look for my son. I don't know if she really did or not. Okay. But she got money from me, though. Okay. Now, let's move on to this. Now, she is not the only one who lived close, what we would typify as close, a block, two blocks, less than a mile from where Austin was working. You told me that there are a variety of family members who live right in that area where the where Austin went to work and of course none of them saw Austin walking anywhere did they no they didn't no, no. and we're not going to get into all the people's names and everything else i i'm just trying to tra- uh make the listeners understand that candy isn't the only one who knew 
uh, who live close to to the employee's place, their uh, employer's place. There were other people, variety. I yeah, mean, you, 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 you told me two or other three people in your family have houses in that area. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know uh, what to make of that. We, we're in the impression that he walked somewhere, but it doesn't seem that uh, anybody saw him, not just family members, but anybody. So um, we're just – the listener's going to have to think about that. Now, there is uh, another – you had mentioned early on that there was a girl that came over through the window. Um, but we're going to talk about another young woman who – uh, and I'm still trying to figure out, I'm still working on this, and maybe by the time that everybody hears our interview, I'll have more information. But there is a young woman who goes by the name on Facebook, me, am I, am I, well, let me try this again, M-I-I space magic, M-A-J-I-K space story, S-T-O-R-I-I. Who is she? She is a young lady that used to stay in the apartment complex where I used to stay. And I never really got to know her as a person. I just seen her. She lived around the corner and downstairs to the right of where I stay. And how my son got to know her, I have no idea. Maybe when when uh, he went to school in American Falls, maybe because that's where her family comes from, mm-hmm. lives. Maybe that's how he knew her. Maybe there was some kind of uh, people that in common. Okay. That's how he got to know her. All right. Do you, I, I don't know. Do you think that they had some sort of relationship or anything like that? He said it was nothing serious. You know, okay. I, I never went to her apartment. He would just tell me, hey, mom, I'm going to go downstairs. So when mm-hmm. he meant downstairs, I knew where he was going. He was okay. going to that young lady's house okay. or a young lady's apartment. And okay. he would stay there for two or three days. He'd come back up, you know, shower, change, whatever, do his business, mm-hmm. what he's got to do here, go wherever he needs to go. And then he'd come home and then he'd, you know, go down there and visit her as well. But it wasn't like I'm moving into her apartment. I'm with her. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it wasn't okay. that kind of a relationship. What, in what time frame was this, Susan? I would like to say that summer, summer of 2017. Okay. All right. And the reason we're bringing her up is because um, there was at least a rumor, and we don't do many rumors, but I, I think we do have to talk about it, is did you find out that maybe – one of her ex-boyfriends had been murdered or something like that. What was uh, the story? Yes. I, I was told um, by the detective that um, she may had a may have had a part in one of her ex-boyfriends um, being murdered. Huh. You know, and... And she was a person of interest to the detective, and that's why he wanted to talk to her. He wanted to find her and talk to mm. her himself. Okay, but the the problem is what? Why can't he find her? Because she's in hiding, because she has federal warrants out for her. Okay. And that, that, as of I know, that's what he's told me. That's why... She, she's nowhere to be found. She's hiding somewhere. Okay. Did Do you remember, uh, do you know if the detective, whoever you talked to, ever told you her real name? No. Okay. I don't remember his okay. name. And, I just know what she looks like. Right. And uh, the listeners, I'm sure, are going to go to her Facebook page and 
uh, find out what she looks like. Um, but the, something I'm mm-hmm. trying to do, Lister should know. I'm, the the thing I'm trying to do is trying to figure out what her real name is, and we're not going to say publicly uh, how we're uh, going about doing that. But that's something, uh, Susan, I could tell you that I'm still working on. That hopefully I will have some answers for you shortly. So we she, so. I, I like She's very distinct looking. <laughs> yes, she is. And we'll just leave it at that. The listeners uh, can go find that out for themselves. But once again, her uh, Facebook account is M-I-I space M-A-J-I-K space S-T-O-R-I-I. All right. And then they can see it for themselves. But we don't know her real name, but I'm trying to figure that out. Um, and I And Susan knows the ways we're trying to do that. But we're talking about it because of what this detective told you. We don't, usually we're not, we don't entertain rumors on here, but if a policeman's going to talk about it, then we have to talk about it. Okay. So maybe okay. Um, Austin ran into her that morning. We just don't know. Okay. Let's go back to Clyde Osborne. Of course, uh, we know about the nice story. We know he came over to your house a, th- a few days later. But you told me we still aren't not sure why he would ever pull a knife on Austin in the first place. However, you did tell me uh, a story about Austin coming to somebody's defense. Um, when did this happen? How did you find out about it? This was, um, I remember now, it was during his birthday. His birthday happened to be on the 17th of December. And for a Christmas present, I had given, I had went and bought him a phone, uh, one of those track phones, and I bought him a card at Walmart. I was just, I happened to be thinking about this last night. Okay. And uh, and I remember because it was uh, it was birthday. It was his birthday. It was in December of 2017. And we went on to Walmart, and I purchased him a phone because he didn't have one. And then when, um. We were we were going through the parking lot, and I didn't know this, but at that time he was using my phone to contact one of his friends on messengers, and he found out that he was there in the parking lot at uh, Walmart. So we went through walk, Walmart parking lot, and we found his friend, and it ha- and his friend um, he got off, and who happened to be with Clyde? So they were all in the car together. They were waiting for another gentleman that was in the in Walmart. I left thinking that okay, he's he's okay, no worries. I know mm. who he's with, so I left. And then a few days later, uh, Austin gets a hold of me and he's like, "Hey, mom, I'm over here at so and so's house. Can you come pick me up?" And I was like, "Yeah, sure. I'll give me about half hour, forty five minutes, and I'll come pick come pick you up." On the way home, he was telling me, he was like, hey, mom, you remember that night you dropped me off with Clyde and the the other gentleman? And I said, yeah, or my friend. He's like, yeah. And I said, he goes, you know, he was sitting there picking on him. He was calling him all kinds of names. He was like hitting him. He was like punching him. He was just talking down to him. And, you know, my friend didn't even do anything. He was just sitting there, you know. You know, he kept telling Clyde, quit doing that, quit doing that, quit bothering him. You know, and just quit picking on him, basically. And and then um, he, he goes, I just didn't like how he was acting, you know, uh, why, you know, why Clyde was acting that way toward his so-called friend. You know, that's supposed to be Clyde's friend as well. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but, and then uh, so Austin stepped up to his defense and told him, you know, just quit picking on him. Leave him alone. I don't know why you're picking on him, you know, because... And then he then he said that Clyde told him, "Well, if you don't like it, then both of you just can get out. You guys can walk yourself." Mm-hmm. So they got out of the car, the vehicle, and they walked over to McDonald's. Well, when they were at McDonald's, I come to find out that my cousin was over there. One of my older cousins was over there, and happened to see Austin and his friend, and had given him a ride back to Fort Hall. <laughs> how okay. coincidence that was. Right, right. But yeah. All right. So what you're saying is Clyde was picking on somebody in mid de- mid December in this Walmart parking lot. Austin stuck up for this guy who was getting picked on and 
you know, stopped Clyde from doing this? Yeah. Okay. Do you know if Austin and Clyde had any interactions after that, before this knife incident at the beginning of February? The whole, like, for example, the whole month of January, do you think that Austin and Clyde saw each other, talked to each other at all? Do you know anything about that? Um, I know that they seen each other. You know, they they hung around each other, but mm -hmm. I have a a video on my phone and it was it's probably the last video I have of my son where there's him, my son, Clyde, Candy and Candy's husband, all at Candy's residence. Mm -hmm. This was a video that was taken. This was the last video that I see of my son, but it was taken at the end of uh, a little bit before Christmas, like two or three days before Christmas. All right. And it looked like in the video that they were uh, getting along, I guess. Whatever they were doing over there, I have no idea. Okay. You know. So that was on Facebook or something like that? Uh, no, it was a recording on my on my phone, on my phone. Because uh, sometimes when my son wouldn't have a phone, he would take my phone. All right. Oh. Okay, so I think we need a little. I, we, yeah, we need a little explanation. So the way the video got on the phone is that Austin took the phone with him, used it to video himself and Clyde and Candy and her husband, and then you get the phone back and see the video on it. Yeah, correct. Uh, okay. All right. So this would have been maybe just a few days after Austin stuck up for this guy, and it does seem that Clyde and Austin were getting along fine. Yeah. All right. But that doesn't change the fact that that Austin told you that Clyde pulled a knife on him. And then Candy, if we're to believe her, she also said that she saw Clyde do this. And then we, we also have this Ambrose guy. But Austin, for some reason, did not mention Ambrose when he told you this uh, story that morning of February 3rd. Was there uh, – I should ask you this. Is it, Was there any other people there – for to witness this this knife incident there was so it seemingly was candy austin ambrose clyde anybody else nobody else that i'm aware of okay all right now we need to talk about clyde regarding this he has uh, a criminal record doesn't he yes he does all right what is it for and when did he go to jail why Dude, just what was the issue? I I do believe it was right after around he around when he turned eighteen, um, mm. he had uh, gotten a young young lady pregnant who was underage. She was a minor. Mm hmm And she, he had gone to prison mm -hmm. for statutory rape, and. I know he's been in and out of jail, prison since then, because he can't stay out of trouble because of drinking and driving. And and while he's while he got out from prison, he would continue to break his probation, and then he would go back, mm -hmm. come back, go back, come back. Okay. I have it in my notes that he went to jail in 2011, and he spent 35 months in jail for the charges that you just talked about. And it doesn't surprise me then that since then he's been in and out of jail. That doesn't surprise me at all. Um, do you know if he ever had to register as a sex offender? I have no idea. No, no idea. More okay. likely, yes, but I don't know. You don't know. Okay. Did you and Austin ever have a chance to talk about Clyde um, being in jail, going to jail? And I have to ask that it – being that you knew Austin and Clyde were hanging around each other, even though they got along, did that ever worry you, that he was hanging around with a convicted felon? I, I did. We did have a conversation uh Probably when he was like 17 or 18, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. I remember telling him that, you know, why he why he went to prison and and stuff like that. 
but to him, but Austin wasn't the kind of person to really hold a grudge, mm-hmm. you know, to, you know, to like, oh, well, he did that. I'm going to stay away from him. I don't want mm-hmm. nothing to do with him. He wasn't that type of a person. He, you know, I guess he gave him a fair chance at, uh, knowing him and knowing the person that he is you you know what i mean yes i do but then when he and then when he got when he when Clyde, i mean when Clyde kept going in and out of prison in and out of jail that's when i stepped up and i told austin i said you know maybe you better start thinking about not hanging around him anymore he's not a very good person you know that he's been in and out of prison already. This is his second time coming back from prison. You know, mm. you know, he's not the same person as he was before. He's a mm. different person. And he's like, yeah, I know, but he's still my cousin brother, you know. But I told him, you know, you just better, I told him, you just better start thinking about hanging around, not hanging around him anymore. Okay. You know, you might get in trouble. You might, right. you might get in trouble for what? he's doing or did or the people that he's hanging around with right okay. you know, we've had this con- we had that conversation okay but to your to your totally, knowledge totally up to him. i'm sorry what to your knowledge has clyde even through the grapevine i know you've only had the one conversation when he came over and then you maybe saw him one other time to your knowledge has he ever made a comment to anybody about what he thinks happened to Austin? Not directly. Mm-hmm. I've, I've heard a comment made from one of my nephew's girlfriends, her friend, who happened to be Clyde's girlfriend at that time. Huh. He told her, don't be hanging around his family, meaning Austin, or you're going to end up in the same place where he is. Hmm. Well, or, mm-hmm. or, oh, no, no, no. You can come up missing just like Austin. Yeah, that's how mm-hmm. he said it. Okay. So, and then he, uh, I want to say my niece, because she's with my nephew. And I said, and I told him, I said, well, why don't you guys go to the police with this? Why don't you tell her to go to the police? Why don't you, you know, nothing ever came about of it. Nobody said anything. Yeah. Okay. Not sure what to make of that. I, you know, I hear a lot of stories like that uh, doing what I do. I'm not not sure what to make of that. It doesn't necessarily mean Clyde had anything to do with the disappearance. We just don't know. Okay. But, uh, but, but that still doesn't explain, I mean – you know, if he ever had an opinion on what happened to, of course, maybe he should be considered a suspect, but we don't know if he ever said, well, I think Austin walked off. I think Austin did this. Uh, nothing like that. No. Okay. Nothing. Okay. He's never gave me an opinion. Okay. Now well, here's, he's, uh, please. He's, um, he's come to my work a few times. And ask my coworkers, mm-hmm. how's Susan doing? You know, is she doing okay? Hmm. How's she doing? You know, I always thought that was strange of him to ask things like that uh, to my coworkers, and they'd come and ask me, "Hey, you know what? Hey, you, did you Clyde was here? You know, or hey, guess who's asking about you? You know?" And mm-hmm. I'd be like, "Why? Why is you know those why questions would pop in my head?" Okay. Um, he, at a few times, um, my older son, he would go to the bars, you know, he would go to the bar and then he would see Clyde. Clyde would see him. Mm -hmm. Clyde would walk out. Mm -hmm. Two, three hours later, Clyde would come back. He would be intoxicated. He'd go straight up to my son and say, I don't know why the police are questioning me. I had nothing to do with your brother's disappearance. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about your brother, you know. Where did it turn into your brother when it was, you know, they considered each other brothers? Mm. You know, and then 
my 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 oldest son would say these things and he would come back and he would tell us and then he and then those were red flags in my mind why would he be saying these things to him if he knew nothing of where my son was or had anything to do with him or you know mm. those were just block my thoughts anyway mm-hmm. do you do you know if you've ever been have you ever been told what clyde's alibi could be for the morning when austin went to work no okay all right now here is uh, something that uh i i I was very surprised that you told me, but we've talked about this Ambrose guy who seems like Clyde's right-hand man. Um, To hear Candy say it, of course, Austin did not say this, but Candy said that Ambrose was also there when Clyde pulled this knife on Austin that night, the night before Austin disappeared. Um, Where is Ambrose now? Ambrose is working with me at my – where – I work. So Ambrose works with you. I just want to make sure the listeners understand that. Listen, uh, you work with Ambrose. I'm not saying you work side by side, but he is employed by the same company. You are under the same roof with you. Correct. And how I have to ask how much interaction because I, this is what I just have to do. How much interaction do you have with Ambrose? Very little. Very little. Okay. But being, being in the position that I'm in, I have to interact with him. Mm-hmm. I have to acknowledge that he's there. Mm-hmm. I have to acknowledge the things he does wrong, the things he does right. In my position. Okay. That I have with the company. Okay. And you have never, though, in the last year and f- roughly four months, you've never asked him about Austin's disappearance? No. Okay. Because that, I don't, uh, I, I don't see him outside of the workplace. Mm-hmm. I don't have any interactions with any of my employees outside of mm-hmm. my workplace. Okay. Um, I would never ask you where you work or anything like that, but are the people above you in this company aware of your connection to Ambrose? Um, that goes back. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to have to kind of rewind a little bit. During the summer of 2018, I had taken it from August to November. I had taken some personal time off to deal with uh, stress, depression, Mm -hmm. anxiety, all the mixed emotions. And during this time, that's when Ambrose had gotten hired with the company. Mm Mm-hmm. And they they were not aware of the situation of what was going on. Okay. So when I came back to work, I was like, whoa. And then when I came back to work, I had went to um, to the HR department and I had told them, I said, do you, you know, I told them the situation. Mm-hmm. And I, and I let them be aware of it in case anything came about or anything might. If I ever blew up at him, they would understand why I ever blew up at him. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. so what you're saying is your supervisors, whatever position you are in, the people above you are aware that there was an incident between your missing son. And Ambrose, and granted, if we are to understand that Ambrose was not the one holding the knife, but Ambrose was there, they are aware of all of that. Correct. Okay. And Ambrose has never brought up Austin since he was working there, since he started working there. No. No. 
Okay. Um, we, I, I try to keep it on, I keep it on a prof- professional level. All right. I don't bring the outside into work. I leave it on the outside, even though I can, I've, I I stay away from that subject there at work with him or, you know, try to with everybody else. But he's aware of it and he knows it and he stays to himself. He don't come to me. He don't, he, he, he will stay. I would, I would honestly say that he stays out of my eyesight. (laughs) He avoids me. Okay. Do you think... Do you think that you would get in trouble if you ever brought up Austin to him at work? Yes, I I I do believe I would get myself in trouble. Okay. Okay. All right, that's just I I have to admit, and I'm sure the listeners think that's one of the weirdest weirder uh stranger circumstances that I've run across in a case where uh, I'm not. We're not saying that Amber's had anything to do with this disappearance, or not. But certainly, uh, I think that there is enough evidence out there, enough information to believe that Amber's was there when Clyde pulled this knife. Okay, I think that that uh, is uh, something that I'm pretty sure happened. That Amber's was there, uh, and so this certainly, once again, does make it a strange situation for you to be in. Um, and I, I'm, I'm guessing, would you say that you've gotten used to it, or would you say that it's still somewhat strange and awkward? Strange and awkward is the same. I don't, you know, like I told you before, I don't, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I avoid it. I avoid it because if I do, I might blow up at him. You sure. Know, I, I would, I would want to confront him, but. There is always going to be a time and place, but not at work. Okay. Do you know if the police have ever talked to Ambrose about Austin's disappearance? I I don't know. Don't know. I can't say. I I did tell the detectives that Ambrose does work with me, mm-hmm. that he he's he's there. I, I don't know if they've ever talked to him or brought him in or questioned him. Did they? Okay, that's all I'm asking. Yeah. I'm just asking, to your knowledge, has the police ever talked to him about Austin's disappearance? No, not not that I'm aware of. So you have this unusual situation uh, working with Ambrose, and I'm sure that uh, listeners, it's can probably be because uh, a lot of my former guests are listeners, and I'm sure they're probably putting them themselves in your shoes uh, right at this point in hearing that. Um, So let's talk about this. What has the past year and so many months been like for you? It's a roller coaster of emotions. It's just been total, total ups and downs and unbelievable. I mean, Mm. it's totally unbelievable. And, you know, I'm, you know, I know you probably always hear it all the time. You know, I'm sure you hear it all the time that, you know, you never thought this could happen to you. Right. Or happen to your family. Right. And I never ever thought it in my whole life or, or let alone know anybody that has anybody you know missing from their own family you know I I never don't know anybody Mm -hmm. and for this to happen to me and my family is really Mm -hmm. mind blowing it just doesn't seem possible, right? It just doesn't thing like yeah. this feels like some nightmare that you're going to wake up from. You know, I'd always, yeah. the first three months, I would, 
I would go, go to work, come home, go to work, come home. I'm just straight home, hoping and praying I would see him sitting outside the door. Or hoping and praying I come walking in and he'd be sitting right here. Or I'd be waiting, phone call, middle of the night, the knock on my window. You know, hey, Mom, it's me. Can you open the door? Mm -hmm. You know, or the or the knock on the door in the middle of the night, you know, to see if, or the phone call, the phone call from the detectives or police standing at my doorway, you know, yeah. or life flight going about, you know, I can hear life flight, the, the helicopter, the one from the hospital, I would hear it at night and I'm just thinking, oh God, I pray, is that my son? You know, I would pray every night, every day. You know, I would just go down the road, think, is that my son walking? You know, people that, you know, look like my son, but is not my son. Yeah. You know, it was just all kinds of emotions. And and I didn't like the first, I mean, I I literally could not take it at work. I had to take time off, like I had said before. Yeah. I took time off from August to November, you know, which is as much as I can, uh, uh, was allowed to me through my company. Yeah. And, uh. During that time, I just, I stayed home. I I didn't want nobody to bother me. I didn't want, you know, I, I lived by myself. And it was just only me and my son here. Mm-hmm. That lived, I, we lived together in my apartment. Mm-hmm. And With your cat, Fred, that you told me about before this interview started. Actually, he came a little bit later. A little later, okay. Yeah, yeah. a little later yeah. on he came, but it was, okay. it was always just me and my son. And, yeah. And coming home, and it was like, I just stayed to myself. I literally closed myself off to the world, to my mm-hmm. family. I just closed myself in. I felt like I, my world... Mm -hmm. was, I wouldn't say over, I just felt like everything was gone. My, my world was gone. You know, I lived for my son. I, we did everything together, you know. But I, Mm -hmm. but growing, but while he was growing up, I always knew that there was a time when he would be on his own. He would become a young man. He would have his own family. He would he would go places, do things. He would have his own life. But never in a million years did I would ever think that or thought that he'd be gone missing. Yeah. And that his life would, don't know whether his life ended there or whether he's out there somewhere yeah. living his life, I don't know. And that, and that's what hurt is the unknowing, the not knowing. Yes, that is a topic that comes up uh, often. That, uh, and this is, I think, the big difference with between missing persons cases and outright murder cases where there is a body and maybe the suspects aren't caught yet, but uh, a body is found. Uh, You know, we know what the method of the death was and, and all these things that even though those situations are very difficult as well, there's not as much mystery and there's still could be some, of course, if the person or persons haven't been caught yet. But uh, in missing persons cases, um, you got nothing. You have nothing. 
you know, no, no answers at all. And this is what makes missing persons cases uh, the most difficult of any thing that law enforcement ever involves itself in. Disappearance cases are the toughest. Toughest. And uh, everything that people can experience in their lives from cancer to war to terrorism and things. What families go through regarding disappearance is right up there with all of those. As far as the pain and everything else, there's there's no doubt in my mind re regarding that. None. Mm -hmm. None. Um, and I know that on top of everything else is that we have must remember for the listeners, is this is a relatively new disappearance from just last year. Um, whereas I, the average age of a case that we cover on the phone is like 20 years old. So, um, so this is still very raw, of course, and I'm not saying mm -hmm. that, you know, but my job is to make sure it doesn't get to 20 years. You know, we hope to be able to resolve this, get the word out there, me help you, continuing to help you even after you've been on the program in any capacity that you'd like to make sure that whatever happened is that we find the answers before it gets to the two year, the three year, the five year anniversary. Okay, that's that's what I see my job to be. Okay, because I don't want you 20 years from now to still not have the answers because unfortunately a lot of my guests are in that exact situation. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. um, that's, you know, uh, as I tell all my guests, we're going to try to do the most we can, the, the most we can for you. Even after you've been on the program. Um, do you have a, do you have a, a, a Facebook page set up for Austin? Anything like that? Um, uh, no, not directly. I use my own okay. Facebook page, and I um just put whatever I can out there mm -hmm. on like reward. I you know fundraising. Um, we've done a, a sunrise prayer for him, and next Saturday. On the eighth of June, we're doing a prayer walk. Okay. Um, here on the reservation. Okay, that'll yeah. be the day after this episode comes out, so that's good timing. That's good timing. That's good. Very good. Okay. It'll be. What do you and being that we started off talking about your heritage, your ethnicity, of course, your culture to start this out. What do you think is going on in the Native American community with these disappearances? You know, what what is going on with that, do you think? What what is I know maybe uh of course you're experiencing it right firsthand and I realize that every disappearance is a little different, but um any insight into it at all that you can pass on to the rest of us? I I believe in, in my son's case, I think it has to do with drugs. Mm -hmm. I think it has to do with money and drugs. Uh, maybe he was, I'm not saying he was caught up into mm -hmm. a lot of drugs or not. I, you know, I, I do believe it has something to do with drugs and money. You know, and do you think that's blame for it. Mm-hmm. You know, or whether uh, somebody might have um, mistaken him for somebody else. Okay. You know, but in the but in the Native American community overall, of course, like I said, it seems like within the last six months, to my perception, there seem to be a lot of more articles about disappearances in the Native American community. And do you think that um, law enforcement is not taking them seriously? Do you think that there's something else going on? Do you, you know, once again, this is your culture. Uh, it's not a culture that I'm, you know, I've not been a part of. I haven't been around many Native American people in my life, to be, to be honest with you. I don't know about my listeners, but um, 
do you perceive the the overall situation to be um, something that is fixable? It can be fixable, but it it's totally up to the community. Mm. I mean, even though even though communities are close, there's that. Mm, I don't know. That thing about you don't you know, but you don't want to tell anybody. You just want to keep it to yourself. You don't want to be involved. You know, it's mm-hmm. how do I put it? Mm, it's like gossip, but you don't want people to come back and say, "Oh well, she said this and he said that." Mm-hmm. But they don't want to say anything. They don't want to say, yeah, I know this and I know that. I heard this from so-and-so. They just don't want to be involved. Yeah. And that's, and that's why and that's why I'm, I'm, we're having this prayer walk. I'm hoping that this prayer walk, you know, will bring people out to talk, will bring them out to say something. To, to give them that awareness that whatever's going on out there in the community, people have to be aware. People have to be aware of this and that they have to be aware of their surroundings, be aware of who they associate themselves with, be aware of, you know, the people next door, what's going on, because it can happen to anybody. You know, yeah. if it can happen to me, it can happen to them and their children. You know, yeah. they need to be aware and not sit there behind closed doors and think that, oh, this ain't going to happen to me. This ain't going to happen to my children. Mm-hmm. It's there. And it feels like it's just getting closer and closer. More people are going to be coming missing. And I don't want to say that like I know it, but it just feels like it. Just the 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 different people that are coming into our community, the different people that people are allowing to come into the community that are dealing drugs, are doing drugs, and the, the, they're allowing it. And I hate to say this, but the tribal police are allowing the drugs to come into our community. They're allowing it to keep going and watching these people go in and out of these drug houses. They're allowing that. They're allowing these other people to come in and disturb the community. Huh. Why do you think they let that happen? Because they don't want to be involved. They don't want to enforce the law. They don't want, they don't want to, maybe because it's their own relatives that's doing the, the dealings or the drugs and they don't want their families to be sitting behind bars or dealing with, you know, the shame of saying, yeah, that's my family member. That's my family member that's dealing the drugs. That's my family members that's doing the drugs. You know, it, mm-hmm. to them it's shameful instead of upholding the law. It is shameful. I agree. Susan, do you have any last words before we complete this interview? If anybody knows anything, the whereabouts of my son, or even if my son is listening. You know, I really appreciate if they would come forth and say something. They just say what they know instead of hiding it and and keeping it to themselves. And if my son is listening, 
son, just come home. We all love you. We all miss you. There's not a day that we don't think about you. But I do appreciate your time and your thoughtfulness and and to allowing this interview to happen, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. And I pray, pray that one day he will come home. Susan, thank you for being on this episode of Unfound. You're welcome. And thank you. And that was my interview with Susan Pivo, mother of Austin Pivo. I thank her for joining me and all of you on this episode. And I want to reiterate our desired unfound to cover more disappearances of minorities. I think Austin's case is a perfect example in which a law enforcement agency is underwhelmed or overwhelmed, depending on how you look at it, uninterested and dismissive, maybe even a bit corrupt. And we hear these things happening in many of Unfound's cases. So the reason isn't because Austin is a part of a minority group. This is just how many police departments act. Oh, he'll come back. Then he doesn't. And it's a shame because although there isn't a lot of information, the information that Susan has is certainly viable. The knife attack, the phone call, the girl from the apartment complex is allegedly on the run, Cousin Candy, the co-worker. Yet I think the police department is still convinced Austin walked off. Then there's the misinformation regarding the FBI being involved. Not sure what to make of that. For me, what bothers me the most about the circumstances of Austin's disappearance is that no one saw him walking the morning after he left his boss's house. That certainly could lead us to think something happened there and not somewhere else, if something happened to Austin at all. Or we could consider that Austin got picked up outside the house. Certainly possible. But then why didn't the co-worker or someone else see the car pull up? Good question. And we can't forget this. If Austin made that phone call, the person on the other end has never come forward. So I'm inclined to believe whoever received the call knows exactly what happened to Austin. But you don't have to be able to see the future regarding crimes to know whoever might have caused Austin's disappearance could do it again. And a majority of people know that. So law enforcement should take Austin's missing persons report a little more seriously. I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.